unfortunately, this is not a freak situation. This is happening more and more. And in fact, um, this discussion that I was about to have, we had planned ahead of this news, and it's extremely fitting. Um, it's, it comes from that expression, you miss the forest for the trees. It's invoked when someone is focusing so much on one facet of something that they, they miss the big picture. And the climate crisis can sometimes feel like the opposite. You miss the trees because you're so freaked out by the forest. You miss the different facets of this issue because the whole thing can feel so overwhelming. So I, I never want to, when we're talking about the climate, forget the big picture, but I do want to zoom in on one aspect of the climate crisis that doesn't always get a lot of attention, and it's the oceans. Over the last 50 years, humans have burned enough fossil fuel, coal, gas, and oil, and cut down enough trees that we have generated an enormous amount of heat, more than 380 zettajoules of heat. Now, uh, you're forgiven if you don't know what a zettajoule is. It is such a massive amount of heat that it's hard for us to comprehend. So scientists have translated it into something that's easier to grasp, atomic bombs. As of 2020, human activity is producing five atomic bombs worth of heat every second. Five atomic bombs worth of heat every second. But only about 1% of that heat actually ends up in the atmosphere. A little bit is absorbed into the land, a little bit into ice, which then melts. Most of that heat is absorbed by the Earth's oceans. Most of the, the globe is oceans anyway, and most of that heat goes to the oceans. And while the ocean has been warming for decades, this past 10 years have seen extreme and relatively sudden temperature increases. And as we enter an El Nino weather system pattern, a system of unusually high ocean surface temperatures, the impact on our heating oceans are becoming severe. The global average ocean temperature hit an all-time high in April. It continues to break records almost daily. Why do you care? Well, one of the impacts of warming oceans is the harm that's caused to marine ecosystems. Coral reefs bleach and die. Mass fish die-offs. Some maritime species attempt to adapt by migrating, including the species of phytoplankton that produce at least half of the oxygen that we breathe. But that's not all. Warmer ocean temperatures are already having immediate effects on your daily life. Warmer oceans contribute to stronger storms. That's what we're seeing. Hurricanes, cyclones, they facilitate more evaporation. People tell me when I cover hurricanes, there's always been hurricanes. Yeah, but they're really strong these days. They're really damaging. The floods are really damaging. They are deadly, as we saw in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. They dump more rain. Look at the flooding that has occurred around the world in the last few days. Three pe four people dead now. Uh, four, three others remain missing in this flash flooding that we're covering right now in Pennsylvania. Last week, torrential rains caused flooding in Kyushu, Japan. Another heavy rainstorm to the north dropped more rain in less than half a day than the region typically sees in an entire month. That storm moved into South Korea last night. More than 30 people have died after being trapped in flash floods in South Korea. In Vermont and New York, one person died. More flash flooding expected this week. Flash flooding kills people. In northern India, where over the last week and a half, torrential rains have tr triggered flooding and landslides, 100 people are known to be dead. Here's the thing. When the top experts on climate change talk about what, what they are seeing, they are ringing alarm bells. They've called it a five-alarm fire, a crisis, a global emergency, what have you. They're telling us we need to take action. It's scary because it's existential. It really is. But it's deeply important not to look away from this. Despair and doom are going to keep us frozen in fear and in inaction. Let's keep our eyes open. Let's protect ourselves. Let's face the challenges that are already here. We need to elect leaders who will make climate, the climate crisis a top priority. Joining me now is Monica Medina. She's the president and the CEO of the Wildlife Conservation Society. She's the first, she was the first special envoy for biodiversity and water resources for the Biden administration. She was the first U.S. diplomat designated to advocate for global bio, biodiversity. You've worked with NOAA. You know of what we speak. I do, Ali. And I'm, I'm, I, you know, we wanted to talk about oceans, but this flooding is exactly the story. It is the story, and thank you again for having me. Thank you for talking about this important topic. This isn't just this year's disaster film. Yep. This is a preview of what we will be seeing year in and year out. So we have to get serious about adaptation. Up until now, adaptation funding has been a minuscule part of the overall effort on climate and global climate change. It's changing now. The U.S. government is putting more and more money behind the kinds of actions that we need that will save lives. We can predict the heat really well. These flash floods like what we've seen today in Pennsylvania last week in Vermont, those are harder. People need to be aware of the danger. Flooding risk 
is a killer, as you've seen this morning, and we need to get people the information they need to get to higher ground faster, earlier, so that we can save lives. So whether it's the, uh, the, the clouds we see in the Northeast from the, fire, the wildfires in Canada, or whether it's the 115 degree temperature in Phoenix, or these flash floods, there's, there's sort of a few points to this, right? At the first point is what we saw, the fire chief yeah. in, in, um, in, in Bucks County. They, they have to deal with the immediate effects. They are now trying to recover the bodies of the people who are missing. Then there's sort of local policy, cooling centers, things that you can do in the short term. Upgrading the grid. Correct. And then, and then we move up the chain, right? There's upgrading the grid. There's finding financing for these things. There's figuring out how to put less fossil fuel in the air. It's a complete system. It is. And we can't forget that nature is an important part of this system. You know, we take nature for granted, but we at the Wildlife Conservation Society have been working on adaptation projects in 48 states for the last decade, and it pays off. There isn't a better current technology for capturing carbon than nature, particularly trees, trees. but even yeah. offshore seagrasses, all kinds of mangroves, ecosystems that are coastal can really help us. And in the meantime, we do need to be prepared for the disasters that are happening. So between creating cooling by planting trees all over this country in urban areas. You know, everybody knows when you're hot, find shade, right? right? That is exactly what we can do today. And we should be doing more and more of it because we can't sort of invent our way out of the climate disaster anymore. So I had a conversation with Michael Mann the other day. And, and on one hand, he says, I'm glad that all of these manifestations of climate change are now causing people to understand it. But he's worried that we're going to tip over in, you know, we were in denial for a while and now we're going to tip over into hopelessness. Right. Um, and, and he and said, let, don't, don't let that grab you. We can't. We have the power. You know, there's this great exhibit at the uh, Bronx Zoo, which is part of the Wildlife Conservation Society. It's a mirror, and people look at it, and it says underneath it, the greatest danger to the, to the world, the animal that is most dangerous. But we are also the one that is most capable of making a difference, and we are today in this country. People can't lose hope. We don't have a choice. We have to adapt now, and we can do it, but we have to make up our minds to do it, and it's something every single person can do, whether it's planting trees in your own backyard, if it's farmers who are changing their agricultural practices in order to capture more carbon, make the soils more fertile, and make themselves more productive, allow us to create more food in a smaller space. There are all kinds of things we can do if we just put our minds to it. And I am determined, and so is our whole organization. I believe in the regenerative power of nature and in people to make the right decisions. This is a moment we can grab it, we can recognize it for what it is, and we can take action. Do you think this administration, uh, A, is doing enough, and B, uh, how do they signal that how seriously they take this? Because for people who, for whom climate is the biggest issue, they're worried that all of our political polarization is pushing this out of the dialogue. Well, I think the administration is doing an awful lot. Congress passed this, you know, two big bills last year that created an awful lot of funding that we never had before on these issues, which is fantastic. But can we always do more? Yes, we absolutely have to do more. And I think the, the thing about nature is that it appeals to everyone. People love trees. Right. The Trump administration was for a trillion trees, and so is the Biden administration. Congress is firmly behind nature and biodiversity, and it is our best line of defense right now. Of course, we need new technologies. We're leaning into those uh, as we speak, you know, changing our electric grid, changing the way we get power. But we have to actually look at what's happening around us. Nature and biodiversity are essential for our economies. We can't live without water. Businesses can't work without water. Farmers can't yeah. farm without water. We need to be shifting our approaches right now today into the biodiversity realm. And this is a chance for organizations like mine who are doing the work on the ground here in the U.S. It's a global problem all over the world. We need the Amazon. We need the Congo. We need Indonesia all across the Pacific. We have to be thinking about how to make nature our best defense yeah. on climate. It's a good way to think about it, and it gives us hope. Thanks, Monica. As always, Thank good to see you. Monica Medina me. is the president and CEO of the Wildlife Conservation Society, former assistant secretary of state for ocean, environment, and science under President Biden. All right, Facebook.